This episode is supported by FX's Clipped, the scandalous story of the 2014 Clippers owner's racist remarks captured on tape and heard around the world. The series charts the tape's impact on a dysfunctional basketball organization striving to win against their reputation as the most cursed team in the league. Starring Lawrence Fishburne, Jackie Weaver, Cleopatra Coleman, and Ed O'Neill. FX's Clipped. Streaming June 4th, only on Hulu. Well, triple-digit heat is right around the corner, but the news doesn't stop even when we want a, a drop. So today on CityCast Las Vegas, I'm here with artist, writer, and beloved CityCast alum Vogue Robinson, as well as my co-host David Figler. And we're talking about more F1 lawsuits, an elections ethics complaint, and an art exhibit all about the Goodman mayors. It's Friday, May 24th. I'm Sarah Lohman, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Hey, before we get into it today, I've got a favor to ask. CityCaster is doing our annual listener survey. If you're new here, please take it. If you took it last year, please take it again. We can't use last year's data anymore. So go to citycast.fm slash survey to take the survey. It's only seven minutes long. We actually timed it. That's citycast.fm slash survey. Ooh, and when you take the survey, you'll also be eligible to win a $250 Visa gift card and a CityCast swag prize package. That's citycast.fm slash survey. David and Vogue, good morning. Hi. Hi. It's good to be with at least one beloved host. Uh, wow. Beloved former host. You oh, don't okay. become beloved until it's in memoriam. <laughs> until you're gone? Yes, yeah. you got to be I gone. Mean, you're beloved to me, Sarah. I'm the, I'm the odd Thank man Thank you, out. David. Mm-hmm. Thank you, David. I, you're also beloved to me. All right, all right, all right. Let's make it about David this morning. David Figler, uh, local treasure. Oh, oh national oh, treasure. I was, I'm you know, sure. I was going to like find another word for the rest of that. Stop. But I, I, Let's get into the news. Not here. Well, actually, David, it comes back to you. So this is all about you. So Great. there's more F1 buzz and we've got a new lawsuit. What's going on? Yeah. F1, the gift that just keeps on giving year round. So we've been hearing rumblings from local businesses on or near the Grand Prix footprint since road construction began nine months before the big race, yeah. which happened last November. Uh, Since that time, the complaints have grown louder, with many of those same businesses claiming they lost millions of dollars due to the inconveniences and road blockages necessary to make a racetrack in the middle of a city. Well, to date, it's just been a lot of high-profile griping and threats to do something about it, and Mm. now we do have our first bona fide lawsuit, and in legal terms, if I may, it's a doozy. There is no possible way that I could sum up the 25 pages packed with legal arguments and facts uh, in a brief way. But here's some highlights. First of all, it's a super legit law firm that has taken on the cause for the Ellis Island Casino. It's NIT. They're uh, suing both F1 and Clark County and are leaving it open that there may be others to bring into the lawsuit as well. There are lots of facts poured in there. Something that may raise eyebrows, including a very exacting play-by-play of how the LVCVA, the Convention Visitors Authority, hastily bound us to this race before any logistics seem to have been thought out. Yeah, mm-hmm. It seems as though uh, there was a payment, a uh, commitment of $20 million of public funds from the LVCVA just for the honor of bringing F1 here. Boo. But the main legal components in the lawsuit are that the county violated all its own rules, waived safety and other rigorous approval standards for something like a giant racetrack, made up new rules, and then violated the new rules, and that often there was insufficient notice to Ellis Island when road closures would occur, Mm. sometimes surprising them so much that workers and patrons couldn't get in to the casino, the place where they worked or played, and some patrons got trapped inside, uh, and that they Mm. had to hire their own traffic control people, even though they were promised that flaggers would be Mm. provided. But Maybe the most important uh, allegation in that whole lawsuit is that the county and F1 and Las Vegas Paving, which was involved in the the process of making the track, all violated 
an obscure 2015 law Love that it. comes with stiff penalties if yes. anyone intentionally blocks the ability for cars or people to enter or leave an open business. I will say, though, that the case has initially been assigned to Judge Joanna Kishner, who is also hearing that Red Rock development case against the county, wow, where the okay. county is getting shellacked. Yeah. Uh, undoubtedly, other impacted business owners will literally follow suit, do a lot of cut and pasting, I'm guessing, and uh, <laughs> find their way into this litigation as well. I feel like Ellis Island has found some like new energy right it's just like we're remodeling yeah our barbecue is good yeah we're gonna sue you like we're not just like and Ellis the beer garden if they win then maybe they'll give us free beer well if they win initially they could shut down f1 in november because if the judge agrees that that law applies here it is oh, uh, a danger idea. danger for the county and for f1 Okay, so, Vogue, let me ask you, some people might say that this is the cost of doing business. Like, it's a casino, it's a high-traffic tourist uh, corridor, like, they should expect things like this to happen. What are your, what are your takes on this? I, I think, no, I think that doesn't apply in this situation. Yes, there is a specific cost of doing business in this town, but... Part of the reason why the the real estate on the strip and strip adjacent is so high is because you are you're expecting a certain amount of consistent like traffic to your business. And so once yeah, the yeah. entryway is blocked, well, then what am I paying for this real, real estate for? Why, why do I pay all these bills, <laughs> you know, to make sure that yeah. my, my business in the location, location, location for it to be blocked off? And so I think that there wasn't enough thought around the impact of F1, like it sounded quote unquote cool. Oh, this race is going to go around the strip. It's going to look like a video game. That's yes. what, you know. Yeah. Precisely. That sounds amazing. But what are the logistics? What does it take? And and really, there probably would have needed to be additional construction to make alternate entrances to most of these places. But even the impact mm -hmm. on the workers, right, and how much earlier they had to get to their jobs and things of that nature, and then how long it took to prepare. Yeah. It's not a hit it and quit it situation. It's not like the Super Bowl where <laughs> we're kind of yeah. prepared to divert traffic and make it happen. This was, we're going to rearrange your landscape and it's going to take however long it takes. The race will happen. And then after that, then we've got to take our time to take the thing down. That's a crap right. ton of time. And so, you know, maybe they're owed. Yeah. Figler, what do you think? Well, it's not just a direct impact that Ellis Island is suggesting this complaint that is the potential here. It's also just sort of the... I don't even know the ethereal indirect impact of all the inconvenience, like literally new bridges were being built. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who would drive by businesses no longer drove by there or the wow. inconvenience of getting there because of the traffic, because of the construction. I guess I have to push back a little bit on, on behalf of the county, even though <laughs> this lawsuit <laughs> cherry picks some very interesting quotes from mm. county commissioners, which seems to support their cause, seems mm -hmm. to support Ellis Island's cause. Do you have one for us? Uh, yeah. Commissioner William McCurdy was like, you bring this to us now, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Is, it, it's just peppered. It's like it's a very chef kiss lawsuit from a lawyer perspective. <laughs> but the pushback the here. Toothpaste back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the pushback here from the county is, of course, going to be if I might, my friends, mm -hmm. um, that there are exceptions for special events and especially high impact special events. And they okay. have been touting that this brought lots and lots of money to the county, although the county also has admitted that they they particularly the county lost half a million dollars and countless constituent service yeah, yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. But the thing just really comes down to should we have gotten into this high impact impact on on the city without having all the logistics like completely wired and what the county is now saying here we are in 2024 looking at the next one coming up you know in the fall is that well we learned a lot of lessons we weren't going to get it right the first time and it's like a lot of people think you should be getting it right the first time. You're a big okay. ass grown up city. So mm. this actually brings me to my next question. So the LVCVA does seem committed to keeping F1 in Las Vegas for however long this contract is supposed contract, to go. Three right? to ten years. Ten yeah. Years. Oh God. Okay. So what are the solutions? What other solutions could there be to help these businesses but allow future races to like continue in the city? What do you think? 
Well, Commissioner Tick Sagerbloom uh, had suggested that a victim fund be established, oh and basically calling the businesses that are impacted victims. But yeah, that was yeah. also shows up in the uh, that oh. shows up in the lawsuit. Um, oh so God. basically, having a fund for these other private businesses. But I think a lot of the people, like the humans, the the folks listening to this podcast right now, who have to avoid that area for months at a time are like, what about us? Uh, I mean, there's mm -hmm. apartment complexes over there that yes. had to install like new entryways and Yeah, people and pay couldn't get that. in and out of their homes. It, it's rough. I mean, you know, look, I, I think that a lot of people think that the legitimate answer is to move the racetrack somewhere where it won't have so much disruption. But I think F1 wants it because that backdrop is unrivaled in the world. Unrivaled. In the Vogue. world. <laughs> Do you have solutions? Can you fix Solutions. it? Solutions. I mean, money is good. <laughs> money is a good start, but it only helps the businesses. And of course, in turn, they will continue to be able to pay their employees. But is that really a solution? Because if, if the county already lost a million or half a million, yeah. excuse me, then where are they going to find this extra money in order to subsidize <laughs> whatever these yeah. businesses lose? So I'm just wondering where this magic money is coming from. Can I, I would I, I would like... <laughs> magic money well, to apparently f1's making all this money can we charge them more yeah like, uh, what is but the deal we're paying them we are literally paying, paying them. them lvcva is paying them that's the part that like sucks like thanks for the cluster f <laughs> here's here's money i feel like they gotta just move it like i think they should have one component of the race maybe go through one street on the strip that is sure. already kind of blocked off and then like go elsewhere. And I don't know how that works. I don't be looking at maps that much. <laughs> Somebody else will I mean, they are, me. they are talking right now about creating other events around the city because, you know, downtown and a lot of the other oh, hotels God, no. that weren't directly in the middle of it all took huge hits. I mean, there were some casinos that said that they had the worst year in 20 years uh, during like that weekend. Very so they're trying to spread that businesses actually made money during F1 and that far more were impacted. So why are we booking events on which businesses are losing money hmm. and the county is losing money as opposed to booking events which are bringing money into the city? That's how this was sold. Well, and they're, they're arguing that, that it still brought money into it, generated money into the city. But that For comes from Jeremy people. Aguero, you know, <laughs> and a lot of people question his modeling uh, and understandably so. Jeremy Aguero, of course, is the analyst who seems to be hired whenever LVCVA or a sports team wants oh. to prove that what they're doing has a gabillion dollar impact always. Is this your favorite analyst that isn't really? Well, he's not an <laughs> economist. He's yes. an analyst. Listen, I'm wondering, could RoboCops help in this situation at all? <laughs> Wow. You want drones. You want drones delivering food oh, to everybody from those businesses. And you want pretzels from Ellis Island droned out. I want a RoboCop to carry me in his big strong arms across the threshold. Of, I like this um, image. I support this yeah, image. Of the racetrack. Okay. Well, it seems like about 11 already rich people made money. That is my unprofessional opinion. <laughs> and uh, what a mess. I'm really interested to see how these lawsuits play out. All right, Vogue, we're coming to you. So it's election season and we've got a pretty controversial ethics complaint. Can you tell me more? Why, yes. So <clears throat> Steve Wolfson, or as we like to call him, Daddy Steve, uh, who is the district attorney. Is that what we call him? Yeah, that's what we're is calling it? him for today's for today's uh, <laughs> section of communication. I, I am not calling him that. Uh, because he is the district attorney and he is Rebecca Wolfson's dad. And He's a literal daddy, So yeah. he appeared in one of her ads. And of course, Roger Kaplan, who is a longtime Las Vegas resident, uh, filed a complaint to the Ethics Commission and said, hey, he is using his position. He is using like his capabilities to make sure that his daughter gets a good job <laughs> with higher mm. pay <laughs> and he's using his role to basically move her forward and she already makes enough money so what's interesting to me about this complaint is that oh, what is she got... running for i'm sorry oh yes that's an excellent question so she's running for a municipal court judge and so that's okay. what he said in the commercial is that you know she'd be a great municipal court judge but the Ooh, so issue he doesn't is endorse her he's not just like there 
No, he is there. He is saying she is wonderful. <laughs> She's yeah. going to be a great judge. And then in the little box underneath where it says who he is, it's like Rebecca's father. But if you know the name and you know who your DA is, then it's like a wink. It's a little extra nod to, you know, who better to tell you that this this woman is going to do great at this role. And so, of course, the complaint was filed. When they asked um, Steve Wolfson to respond, he didn't. He said no comment. (laughs) And so Mm. let me read y'all the law so we can kind of parse through the little section of the law. So the law, NRS 281.400, parentheses two for for the nerds, for the studiers, uh, says a public officer shall not use their position to secure or grant unwarranted privileges to any person to whom the public officer or employee has a, a commitment in a private capacity. The the article goes on to say that includes close relatives. So that's the rule. If you have a commitment to a person in a private capacity. So um, let me jump in here. So, I mean, David, what did you think? Like, what were your initial thoughts on seeing the Clark County's DA in a campaign ad for his daughter? So... I've been doing this podcast for two years. This yeah. might be one of the more awkward conversations that I'm about to have Uh-oh. for a number of reasons. Because oh, you, you know them all. Because I know them all. Yeah. And let me just say this. Number one, we should make it very crystal clear here that the ethics complaint is not against the candidate, Rebecca Wilson. Yeah, it's against okay. her father for doing things to help her. Okay. Mm-hmm. So she is not the target of any ethics investigation, Correct. to my knowledge. Secondly... Uh, I used to hold this job. I used to be a Las Vegas municipal court judge. So I know a lot about the workings of that court. Um, It's a super interesting race that nobody knows anything about. No one knows what the Las Vegas municipal court does. Uh, In fact, it handles mostly the the smallest cases, the misdemeanors that happen within the city jurisdiction. Judges Um, on ballots are always overwhelming. And there's often not a lot of information out about those candidates anyway. Right. And all three candidates are interesting in their own right. But because this particular candidate has a last name that is very well known, Mm -hmm. and she has Mm -hmm. leaned into it. And it reminds me very much of the Saturday Night Live sketch with the Nepo babies, where they were like, had the (laughs) Nepo baby packed, where they go, foot in the door and so much more, foot in the door and so much more. Mm -hmm. One of the few very funny sketches on SNL in the past several years. Shout out. Oh, listen, it's just facts. These are just facts I'm spouting. And look, she has leaned into it in this particular race. Would she be getting all the endorsements and all the money coming to her campaign but for the relationships perhaps forged by her father and her mother? So her mother is a former judge, famously who was the judge who presided over the OJ trial. And so in that commercial that is part of the ethics complaint here— it's like, hi, I'm Steve, uh, and I think my daughter's the greatest. And what father wouldn't say that? That's a, right. a wonderful thing, and I don't think anyone should be criticized for doing that. And then it cuts away to a shot of him in the role, presumably as a district Ooh, attorney. Suggested. And then his mother come, her mother comes on and says, I think my daughter's the greatest in the world, which, of course, she may very well be. Um, but then there's a cutaway to her mom on the bench in her judicial robe. Oh, and that's not so, even in the complaint. Wait, even if I can, like, break in here, like, it's so the ad just says, you know, Rebecca's father, Rebecca's mother, but the issue is then it's showing them in these roles. It's Arguably so, Steve Wilson in the role, but clearly it shows Judge Jackie Glass in right, her, right. on the bench in her robe. Yeah. And and so, you know, this becomes kind of the the fodder of the unspoken role of juice in our community. So Vogue, like he's being presented as a private citizen in the ad. You know, it says Rebecca's father. So like, what is your take? Like, why shouldn't he be able to support his family? She does have a famous dad. Yeah, I think in this scenario, it's because he's a district attorney. And I think if he had maybe a different job, even within the government, like if he had a different role, but to be the district attorney and she's going for judge, I could understand his sphere of influence on folks. For me, honestly, when I need to vote for judges, I go to David's page and I'm like, who's David tell me to vote for? And I pretty much (laughs) vote for (laughs) what David says because I know David knows. Very, very private conversations. The judges closely. So yeah. I like I check his list and I check three other lists. And those are the lists that I trust for voting for voting for people. But I think long term, if the ethics committee. And so here's the thing. So Karen Jenkins, who's the vice chair of the ethics commission, she says that, you know, hey, I've been the vice chair of the ex- ethics commission. Him appearing in the ad as a proud dad is not using his position. She says it mm. may smell a little bad, but I don't see it mm. as rotting fish. So she feels like 
shrug. And I, I'm i kind of in the middle about it because mm. what's the point of having a dad who has that history? And also, doesn't it make me as, as a candidate more not reputable? Like, wouldn't you trust me more if you knew that lawyering ran in the family, that this was a place mm-hmm. that I come from. And so in that way, I can understand wanting to use that particular benefit. But it, it, it is, it's still nepotism. Like you're going to call it what it is. And so it's, it's unethical. Yeah. But the ethics committee sounds like they say it's not. And to be super clear, the district attorney's office uh, kind of lords over the county courts um, n- doesn't have direct connection with the city court where Uh, the judge race that we're talking about is held. So just to make that very clear, it's not like her dad would be appearing in front of her or anything like that. And this does come on the heels of a Nevada Current article that says that for some reason, uh, as a deputy city attorney, Rebecca Wolfson received accommodations that were uh, supposedly unavailable to other employees, such as a higher pay than her colleagues and not having to take pre-employment drug tests. So you know, it's gotten a little nasty. But this is not about her. Well, that's the question. Like, it, nobody is directly going. I mean, one of her opponents, Ray Kennedy, starts her ads by saying, I'm not a product of legacy. What I am, you know, dot, dot, dot. So because these races are rarely direct, there's there's all these things swirling around of who should be the next judge. And it's really interesting how it culminates in an ethics complaint and not conversation about the merits of the various candidates. Hmm. Mm. Interesting and interested to see how this develops. All right. We got one more on a slightly lighter vote, but I am so curious to get your thoughts on this. So there is an art show. It's opening at Rebar. I feel like a favorite spot of us all down in the Arts District. Mm -hmm. It's going to be up in June, and it is original artwork dedicated to the life and times of the Goodmans. (laughs) 25 years of Goodman mayors coming to a close. And so there isn't any one artist here. Actually, anyone could submit. I believe they have until the end of the month. You know, give it it a Google if you want to. Your art just has to do has to have something to do with one of the Goodmans. So interestingly, too, there's also a $5,000 budget for Rebar to purchase artworks out of the show, which will go into Artie's Steakhouse, which is the new venture that the owners are opening soon in the Historic Commercial Center District. Hmm. I love to see some new businesses to come in there. So, like, your art can go in the show, and not only does it have a chance to get bought by the public, but it could get bought by the rebar owners itself to, to be shown into infinity as your tribute to the Goodmans. The exhibit is called King and Queen of Las Vegas. Oh, boy. And uh, <laughs> your deadline is May 31st, Vogue. I know you can whip something up. <laughs> so uh, that's it. It is called the King and Queen of Las Vegas. Is it weird to think of the Goodmans as Vegas royalty? I don't think so. I think Oscar made it his role to really be the figurehead of the town, the flamingo, if you will. Mm. <laughs> and so kind mm-hmm. of running around town, putting his face kind of everywhere and making sure that people knew. So it, even now, as candidates are running for mayor, a lot of them are saying like, oh, you know, this my job is to be the spokesperson for the town. I am the representative. They're not getting into like the nitty gritty of the job and the decisions they have to make and the conversations and the meetings they got to sit in. They're just like, I got to be the face of the town. So... Mm. In some ways, yeah, I think the Goodmans definitely are. And I think for better or for worse, with Carolyn, people tend to remember. If I tell somebody I live in Vegas, they're like, oh, oh, that lady's your mayor. And I'm like, oh. That (laughs) lady. So I think, yes, they're Vegas royalty. King Oscar and Queen Carolyn? I wouldn't call them that, though. (laughs) I, I don't like it. I, I like the Goodmans very much. In fact, I probably have more love than like for Oscar and Carolyn as human beings and individuals. Mm-hmm. Uh, as leaders, I mean, this is the tour, the the, the victory lap around the city. Uh, and people are deifying them in a way that I don't think is healthy to... We've like, seen that a lot in this mayoral race. Good governance. Yeah. You know, yeah, we are seeing just love fest, love fest, love fest. You know, they asked some of the candidates, have they done anything wrong? And they had, oh, I don't even know. And it's like, you know, they're not beyond criticism. Mm-hmm. And we have we had a whole episode on like how many tributes already are out there to Oscar and Bronze Oscar and, and Carolyn and all okay. over the city. Here's the thing. It doesn't have to be a tribute. It does not specify that oh, it has those to are like... Gonna, those are going to be the ones that win, I'm guessing. Well... 
I mean, we know we know ish the owners of Rebar. I mean, I, okay, you know what? I actually don't know who's jurying the exhibit. Right. But it doesn't say anywhere. It just says it has to do with the Goodmans or their impact or their time as mayor. It doesn't have to be good. And I hope that there are some <laughs> pieces in there lampooning them, right? You you would hope, but uh, they don't necessarily take kindly, uh, Oscar especially, to criticism. He is notorious for pushing back in ways such as, I'll have that guy whacked, things of that nature. You know, he used to be a, a mob oh. lawyer. Uh, he, he, he picked up some phrases. Okay, David, then what's your art going to be? If you're submitting an art, what's it going to be? And what's the title? Um, mm. The Journey. And I think I just kind of like focus on their pre-political time frame where, you know, Oscar was a high powered lawyer and Carolyn was a, you know, a a very giving community member. And then maybe there would be like some sort of like uh, horizon in front of them where they can go into politics and they give each other a sort of a forlorn look or something. This is a painting you're going to make? No, this is going to be a mosaic and I'm going to do it painstakingly and it's going to take up the entire wall of the rebar. It's going to be... I think be... it sounds like a very soothing project, <laughs> honestly. It's going to be like the walls of Parks and Rec. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> okay, Vogue, real-life artist. What will your art yeah, be? Yeah, let's you hear from a real-life artist. I think all of us are artists. Uh, I will start there. So definitely all of us are capable of creating beautiful things. I think I would do like a aerial view of the town like before and mm. after each of them because I think the amount of like the mm. new buildings and the different things, the way the strip has changed over time. And then I and that would probably be the Oscars. got to be a diptych. So you got to have two pieces that kind of connect. Mm-hmm. And so I think, yeah, one will be kind of how the town looked at the end of Oscar's tenure. Yeah, yeah. The other side of it, I think, will focus on youth because a lot of what Carolyn Goodman did had to do with, like, youth. And she started a couple of new departments for the city specifically about how how we take care of our youth and what kind of ways we can kind True. of remove some barriers so that students can can go forth and learn. So I think one will be, like, kids and parks and something joyful in that in that realm uh, and the other one will be kind of like an aerial view of the town and how it looked after that's what i'm thinking right now but i mean like you know this is like on the spot <laughs> these are just ideas well you've got until next week to put it together uh yeah mine's gonna be a zine uh we all have a zine. it's gonna be called the interview and it's going to be a shot by shot recreation of the interview with Anderson Cooper. Oh no. And we'll like cut to people in front of their TVs. Uh, uh. We're gonna like cut to Anderson's reaction shots of like, ah, oh, hmm. because you know what? I feel like we've gotten to this place where like, oh, well, what was it a big deal and a lot? No, that was some effed up S. It was one of the most insane things that's ever been out there. The world will never forget it and it should never forget it. Of course, it's the famous Anderson Cooper interview with Carolyn, where she said that Las Vegas should be a control group for getting rid of COVID precautions. And I guess her heart was in the right place because, you know, we were had no money coming in. And that was very scary. But also what a a stupid suggestion in a bizarre interview. Sorry, Carolyn, you know, I've championed some of the other bananas shit you've said. The deadline to submit your art is May 31st. So like, let's get let's get some good stuff in there. I'm really, really curious to see it. And the show should go up in June. So there you have it. Oh, by the way, speaking of mayors, we're actually about to wrap our series of mayoral Mondays and what a journey it has been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so early voting starts tomorrow. You've probably already got your ballots in your mailbox. And we do still have one more episode. You should definitely check out, I think, David, the wrap up we did where we had a conversation about all the interviews we did. Super yeah. informative, right? That was a really uh, fun back and forth about the interviews we did do. But we yeah. do have one more coming up. We do have one more Ooh. coming. A very and- special one. Yeah. It's a Las Vegas mayor. Uh, it arguably is uh, a very famous uh, Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Vegas mayor what? who people don't often hear from. And this mm-hmm. is an exclusive first time exclusive. interview in Las Vegas. So definitely Vogue looks delighted. Get on that feed, Vogue. So we'll Listen see on you on Tuesday. We'll see you on Tuesday, Vogue, because you're going to get show. to hear from the mayor of Las Vegas, but not Carolyn Goodman or Oscar. Yeah. A mayor of Las Vegas. A mayor of Las Vegas. Oh, and by the way, as a special bonus for our CityCast Las Vegas members, we're going to be releasing an extended cut of this special interview in their feed on Tuesday, ad-free. So if you haven't already, you can sign up and become a member at any time at membership.citycast.fm. And while you're poking around, take the survey, too. Just hang out on our website (laughs) doing admin. 
All right, everyone. David, Vogue, thank you so much for this, this wonderful conversation. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Vogue. Thank you, Sarah and David. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. Our producers this week were Sonia Cho Swanson, Leila Mohammed, and Selena Say Reynolds. Our newsletter editor is Rob Catchell Reese, and our hosts are David Figler and myself, Sarah Loman. Music is by OG Moose, Epidemic Sound, and all the kimonos. We record this show on the traditional homelands of the Nawuvi, the Southern Paiute people. And if you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Las Vegas. We'll be back Tuesday morning with more news from around the city. Take care.